four weeks. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can possibly, um, but please keep those questions coming. Um, we keep an eye on our social media feed all the time, so if, if we're not able to answer it in the episode, we'll try and answer it offline for you. Um, but you're welcome to phone any of our TAs or any of our mills on uh, we, where you can get the contact details on our um, website. That's uh, epol.co.za. Um, and there you can get all the contact details. So everyone will be, all, all those numbers will be there. So please contact anyone and ask them there. Um, next up, I just want to introduce the different participants today. It will be myself, Walter Hildebrandt. Um, we've got Stefan Jacobs and Martin Schlongu joining us, as well as Sipo Mbonyana. So without further ado, I'm going to jump straight into the first, uh, first question so we can get as many of them done in this time. The first question we've got is from Gadifele. The question is, is it safe to start broiler, broiling with small chickens in winter? Martin, would you like to start that one off for us? Yes, Walter, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to our viewers for joining us. We truly appreciate you guys being here with us and uh, yeah, welcome to episode four of the EPOL Export Series. Uh, to regarding that question there, Walter, the answer is simple and it's yes, it is. What is important is to create a suitable environment to allow the chick and the feed to perform. So that means you have five things to look at. The first point is your housing condition. Good insulation. You don't want extra winds to be blowing into that cage with good curtain management and allowing that 10% space at the top of your curtains to allow good ventilation of air and, and disposition of fresh air coming into your cage. And then second point is the heating. You want equal distribution of heat within your cage. By that I mean you don't want to create uh, cold spots within within your within your cage. So if you're looking at a Mbaula system where you use a 210 liter drum and um, to, to make a fire, just make sure that you do attach that uh, um, what you call it the system to extract the smoke out of out of the cage to avoid carbon dioxide build up in the cage and affecting the respiratory system of the chicks. It's a chimney, um, rather. That's the system I'm referring to. So room temperature, uh, water, and feed is very important. We often make the mistake of uh, keeping the chicks in a warm space, but then going outside to our big drum of water um, that stayed cold and it dropped um, to um, low temperatures and giving it direct to the chickens. So it's always best that the water and feed should be at room temperature. So store it in a very, I'd say, um, in, a, in a warm place or rather in some cages in, in the emerging market rather, they keep the same feed almost like in the same cage when there's enough space allocated for that. Then you allow it to be room temperature and your 20, 25 liter water drums stick in the cage and you can just use that those to refill. So that's very important. And the lighting program remains important. If you do not follow uh, the correct lighting program, it will affect your chicken performance. So also remember that in the winter, the get, days get darker much quicker. So do adjust as the season, as you change from season to season, which is very important. So all in all, you want to create optimal conditions for your chick to perform. Take it as a human. If it's not, if it's very cold in the day, it's very unlikely that you'll go to your fridge and drink ice cold water. So take it in such a way. What you do for yourself, that's the same environment that you want to create for the chicken. And always remember the temperatures involved in managing. You can go on epol.co.za um, or Google the epol broiler management guide and you'll find the regulations in there. You sort it. Thank you, Walter. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. Our next question, Martin, I'm going to direct it to you as well. It's from Awonke. Um, what height does a broiler house have to be? Um, average height, what can we look at? You've seen quite a few houses in your time. Yes, yes, uh, Walter. Thank you again. So, uh, Awonke, uh, great question there. I'd, I'd just take what I've seen in the field and put it on an on average, as uh, our farmers asked. From uh, the, the, the wall, your side walls, from the floor to the roof level, you want an average height of 2.2 meters. So now this is, makes it easier for a, 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 let's say one of your flock managers that is almost 2.2 2 meters uh, tall um, to be able to move there. And then 
your center of your roof, when you when you use an A-arch, um, an arched roof, can be 3.2 to 3.6 meters, right? And remember, at the arch at the top, if you can use, um, they normally put in that central system that allows in uh, the inflow of air, and you just put in the, uh, the, the, the mesh wire to prevent birds from flying, and that's a good system to also assist in that circulation of air, and the height in the center, we said 3.2 to 3.6 meters, but floor to roof, 2.2 meters. That's an adequate system that you allow. And then a tip um, for you guys to use in the field is to paint your roof white. This helps in um, slow uh, or, or, or uh, heat retention in your cage in the winter, and then in the very hot summery days, for it reflects the sunlight back. So there will be less heat coming directly into the cage. <laughs> So if you can if you can do that on your cages, that will help you um, greatly. Awesome, thank you, Martin. Our next question is from Kati. Um, the question is posed: How many lights, feeders, and drinkers is needed for a hundred chickens? Um, Sipo, you referred to this in episode two. Um, would you like to take this one from uh, for us? It seems we've, uh, we've lost people there. For, there we go. Day. Um, everyone can hear me now. Um, I was saying um, thanks to Kati Spongi Lengabani for a question. Um, you know, good day to our viewers and colleagues. Um, just a quick one on, on this. I think maybe I'll first um, go for the answers and then um, give a bit of clarity towards the end. Um, on the lighting side, it must be rem uh, remembered that this would greatly be influenced by the intensity of the light bulbs that you're using or the brightness. Um, those that were watching on, on the episode that we did with Walter, I think that was episode two, um, they will remember that we did emphasize quite a lot on the brightness or, or the intensity of the lights. Um, so to choose straight from the heap, um, as Danny would say, two lights should be sufficient, uh, but the guy that the is in the house such that um, chickens would be able to identify where water is, where um, feed is, um, and they are able to freely move around. Um, on the drinker's side, um, you get different um, quality sizes or um, capacities, um, so it will be difficult to pin on one number, but just to give a bit of clarity there. Um, if you're using a, a four litre chick font uh, or chick fountain, for instance, you are probably going to need three of those for 100 chicks. Um, but if you're using uh, your 10 litre uh, capacity chick fonts, you are going to need one. Um, and if you're using a bell drinker, which is usually more on the commercial side of things, you're also going to need one. So for every hundreds that you keep, you're going to need one uh, 10 litre um, chick font or you're going to need one um, bell drinker. If you have feed troughs uh, or drinkers uh, or water lines, you're probably going to have to allocate either um, 2.5 centimetre per bed uh, on the feed traps, or you would have to rely on the capacity per nipple um, that goes into the cages on the drinker's side. Straight into the feeders, um, if you're using feeder pens, you are probably going to need about 45, um, or you can allocate 45 to 80 birds per pen. Um, and obviously, um, as your uh, birds grow older, you will have to try and adjust so that there's sufficient feeding space. If you're using tube feeders, you would usually in the market get anything in the of 38 to 40 centimeter diameter. Um, and for those or, or for that type of feeders, you can allocate 70 beds per tube. Um, so all in all, in summary, you, I would say um, it depends on what you're using. Um, and given the numbers that I've uh, highlighted above, you should be able to comfortably service your 100 chickens. Uh, thank you, Walter. Awesome. Thank you, Sipo. Next question is from Kati. How many, uh, sorry, from Mpo. At which time intervals do you switch the lights on and off as per the chart he showed? Now, the he referred to there would be myself. Um, I dealt with this in, in episode so two, um, as Sipo mentioned just now. Um, so, so time intervals, you'll see we, it says there the amount of darkness that you want. Now, way back there was always a thought that the longer you kept the lights on, the better the birds did because it gave them more time to eat, which gave them more time to grow. But what they found out is that there's a, lot, a big stress factor to that as well. So, um, so if you don't give them darkness, they don't get time to rest, and then the stress is high, and that stress then actually 
brings down the FCR or increases the FCR, depending on which side you're looking at it. So it, it uh, decreases your efficiency. Um, so at what intervals you'll see at day one, which is when you'll get the checks, it's a 23 day light, one hour darkness. So literally what that means is you leave the light on for 23 hours and give them one, one hour of darkness. Now, usually you get your checks probably delivered early in the morning, say eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Um, obviously, if you've got good lighting coming in from the outside, you don't necessarily need uh, lights as in a light source, um, but just make sure that the lighting is, is sufficient in the house. Um, and then I would I would keep those lights on all the way through until probably the next morning around, depending on when it starts getting light with you. But take whenever it starts, the first light you see, about an hour before that, switch the lights off, um, and then you'll, you'll, uh, you'll have that hour of darkness, and then they'll actually come into light as the day gets lighter. Um, something to remember is that it's a gradual off and a gradual on of the chicks. You don't want a sudden off and on because that'll startle the chicks. Um, so preferably over a 45-minute period that you, that, it, that you put the lights on and it starts heating up and lighting up um, over 45 minutes until the full light is on. Um, and then from there on, you increase your darkness. So day two, for example, you probably look at about three to four hours darkness. So you'll switch the lights off earlier, um, three hours earlier than when it was one hour. And then you go to seven. And by the time they are 100, 100-ish grams, which is usually about four, call it four days-ish, then you'll start looking at, at getting the nine hours. Now, in the summer, that's pretty much what our, our darkness is at, at night. Is uh, Our daytime is, is longer and our nighttime is about nine hours. Um, but in the, in the winter, you've got more dark to work with, so you'll have to put your lights, uh, keep them on for longer, and then switch them off. Um, yeah, I hope that, uh, that, answers, that answers that question. Um, next question is from Naledi. The question is, advice on different types of wood shavings available. Sipo, you mentioned this in, also in episode two. Um, yes, Walter. Um, maybe it would be advisable to try and tweak that question slightly to say, uh, maybe advice on different uh, types of bedding that are available um, so that we can maybe broaden the answer that we can give there. All right. But, um, you know, basing it on the original question, food shavings, and then you'd have sawdust. We did discuss it, uh, discuss it briefly on our uh, episode two, like like you indicated, water. Um, and we did discourage the use of sawdust um, on the basis that it's too powdery or it's too dusty. Um, and it does pose the risk that your chips would actually um, sort of consume it, um, you know, tempering with um, your, your food consumption. We also did indicate that by inhaling the dust that comes with, uh, with sawdust, it does um, pose a health risk from a respiratory um, you know, disease or infection point of view as well. So um, we then said we do advise our viewers to actually um, stick to using wood shavings, which is actually more, it's, it's more chippy um, and, and it does absorb, you know, um, for instance, if there's water spillages in the houses, um, you know, it does absorb that. It does provide cushion and it does uh, provide a bit of a, um, an insulation and um, it also minimizes uh, bed to floor conducts as well. But um, to broaden the, you know, the answer as well, you do have different types of beddings that one can use. Um, you know, um, anything from the wood shavings that we're recommending, some farmers using soda, some farmers using um, shredded paper, some farmers using uh, any plant material, straws, grass, um, and, and whatever else. But so far, what we do recommend um, would be the wood shavings, uh, that followed by um, shredded newspaper, um, it, it also does uh, do a decent job as well um, if you have access to that. Um, I think that pretty much covers um, Naledi's question there. Yes, awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, our next question is from Loazi. Uh, Loazi asks, uh, is the paraffin heater, paraffin odor, harmful to chicks during, brooder, uh, during breeding? So, on that point, um, it's not something that I've, I've had much to do with, but on the paraffin, something to watch out for, as Martin mentioned it earlier as well, is the carbon, carbon dioxide buildup. So you need to make sure that you've got sufficient ventilation that you don't have carbon dioxide buildup. And the paraffin odor itself, if it's burning properly and it's burning, which it does in paraffin heaters, 
then, then you shouldn't get much of that odor or at least of the residue. So your big risk would probably be carbon dioxide. And what then happens, how you can see that is um, when you've got carbon dioxide buildup, the chicks actually go and lay down. They become very lethargic. They don't eat and drink or run around. They don't chirp as much. Um, so Marcia, Martin also mentioned about keeping those, those curtains or that minimum ventilation just to have airflow through. Something very important with this as well. It's the same principle as Mula where you, where you use um, a wood-fired or coal-fired drum in the house. Make sure that those gases get outside. They're not released inside the house. Otherwise, you are going to have a health problem with, uh, with those birds. Um, but always have a look at that temperature. Keep that thermometer close. Make sure that your temperatures are as per the age and the temperature guide that we, we give on our, what mentioned there. The website as well as our, our broiler management guide but you know use use those uh, those guidelines as your your aim for temperature the next question is from randall um it's also also based on on um on space so let me just quickly read the question then i'll go from there what are the reasons for chicks migrating to certain points of a chicken house and what can you do to get an even spread across your floor to ensure your day old chicks get an optimum start to the first few days? What is the best way to place chickens full or half house bruising, brood, brooding? Now something, this is also something I mentioned uh, in episode two, um, but something that you have to watch out for is if your birds tend to either clump together the temperature is probably too cold. If they try and get away from the heat sources, the temperature is probably too hot, warm. And if you see that all migrate to the one side of the house um, and try to get away from something or away from a side or towards a side, the things to look out for is if there's a draft. So is there a draft coming in and that the chicks are trying to get away from the cool air that's coming in? Or then if they're moving towards a draft, um, is your ventilation sufficient? So if there's uh, the carbon dioxide buildup because of not insufficient uh, ventilation, then what you'll get is the chicks will tend to move towards where there's a draft, where they can feel oxygen and where they can get oxygen. So something very important. And then on the point of full versus half house brooding, now look, the smaller the space, the easier it is to keep it warm. So what a lot of people do is they put curtains and they make the house smaller. So you could probably start off with something of, call it 30 to 40 birds per square meter when they're that small. Um, you put curtains in so that the heat stays in and it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to manage um, like that because they're not as big so they don't need as much space. And then as they get older, you open more of the house to them. Um, but there are a lot of, especially on the commercial side, a lot of the guys split the house. They even only use a third of the house, um, place the chicks there, and then keep that one part warm, and it's easy to manage, and all the chicks are at one place, and you put all your paper feeders and your fonts and all of that down, um, and then as they get older, then you open up more of the house and you, you manage the full house from there onwards. So I hope that answers your question, Randall. Our next question is from Mbuzi. Um, in what quantities are EPOL feed available? Now, I just need to mention here that we are mills are, are, we've got five mills over the country, and um, six if you count the the, the Druk mill that also produces EPOL feed in, in Limpopo. Um, so I'm going to try and manage this from, from that point of view. I'm going to give it to Martin and Sipo, Martin to handle the northern part of the country and Sipo the southern part as to packaging, sizing and how they do things. Martin. Walter, thank you very much. Um, so Epo Fido, thank you, Mutsi, for the question. Our packaging in the northern side in um, Gauteng specifically, our mill is situated in Pretoria West in the industrial area. We have our poultry feed layer specifically is available in 40 kg. And with our broilers, we have our sure grow range available in 40 and 50 kg. And then we have the corner range available in 40 kg. And we do have our bulk loading. And it's important to stress that within our industry, the bulk loading, uh, we refer to loading in tankers and offloading into silo systems. That's what we refer to bulk. So from the Pretoria factory, um, we, we also al um, allow inquiries 
where the customer can feel free to contact us and we look into the situation and see how best um, we assist them. So um, I encourage when we are contacted, let's have a conversation. It's not just a one liner. How much is this? How much is that? We'd like to get deeper because with our feed comes expert technical advice. So I'd like to assist you with your feed requirements and also come to your farm to make sure that we are in line and the feed will perform. Over to you, Sibo. Cool. Um, thanks, Martin. Um, I'll speak for KZN, KZN Eastern Cape and the Western Cape um, EPOL branches as well. Uh, we pretty much have a standardized uh, packaging quantities. Um, you're looking at about, uh, it's 40 kgs for all our bags. Um, at the moment, and then obviously on the bulk, we've got different configurations. Um, minimum we can send us, depending on how far are you or the farm is from our closest factory, you're looking at 12 tons, and then it grows for in, in multiples from there. So it can be 12, 18, 24 tons, 30 tons, 34 tons, and 36 tons, depending in which region you're in. Um, but yeah, having said that, uh, everything on the bags at the moment is available in 40 kgs, and then you have bulk in different configurations. Walter. Awesome. Thank you, Sipo. Martin, um, you'd like to comment there? Yes, just to add on this, um, it's important for, I think it was mentioned in episode three, when we did the costing, what is important is not the pack size. The important is cost per kg. You also stress it, Walter, the quality of feed and price per kg to the output of the performance. That is what's important. So I just wanted to add that. And then in our mill in Limpopo, uh, Falbarter Mill, they produce 50 kg of Epol Suregro feed. They do have the Epol Econo range um, in the broilers, and they produce the Shure our layer phase two meal in 50 kg bags. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. Just to add on to that, um, we've got many retailers over the country that we take hands with and try and assist them as well. So our packaging and our products are, are widely, widely available. Um, in Maritzburg, we've actually got a depot here in, in Peter Maritzburg and Willerton Road, and then also an escort where you can actually go in and you're not restricted to buying a certain number of bags. You can walk in and buy one bag if you need be. Um, and you can collect as well. So just to put that one on the table as well. Then we'll take a short break just quickly. So please stay with us, um, watch the video ahead, but uh, please stay with us and we'll be back in less than a minute to keep on going with the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that little video, that little clip. Welcome back to uh, episode four. This is part two of episode four, and we'll keep going with the question and answers. If you've just joined us, today we're doing question and answers, so not like our, our previous three sessions. We're just focusing on the questions you had um, over the last three to four weeks, and, and we've got our four four experts. Uh, we're missing Dani, but the other four, and myself, Martin Umschlongu, Stefan Jacobs, and Sipo Munyana, we are here to, to answer your questions. Please keep them coming. If we don't get to them today, we'll try and get to them next week, or we'll, we'll uh, answer them for you on our social media platforms. I'll jump right in with the next question. The next question was from Paul. When I buy broiler feed in bulk from EPOL, how long can I keep it in my storage? Now, this was also something I dealt with in episode two. So just Martin, just before the break, Martin, um, uh, alluded to the, the different um, definition of bulk. Now, depending on, on where you're sitting from our side, um, bulk is something, like you mentioned, that goes into a bulk tanker that you pump out into a silo. That's bulk, so we'll call it loose format, if that. And then bags is obviously if it goes into bags, depending, irrelevant of whether you buy one bag or whether you buy a thousand bags, that still counts as bag. Understand that bulk is a 
big quantities. So that could relate to, to large quantities of bags as well. Um, so I'm going to answer the question from both a bag and a bulk point of view, if that's all right. So, so on that, with the bags, our, our bags have all got a shelf life of six months. So from production date to, um, to the best before date is six months. Um, so you could probably keep it for that long. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise it as that, and it depends on where you're based. So what do your storage facilities look like? If you've got a good storage facility that's got good ventilation, um, you don't live in a humid, hot area, there's no sun that's shining on the bags, um, and it's good quality storage, then you could probably keep it for up to six months, but I wouldn't recommend that. I would say work on a month to two months worth of feed, I wouldn't take much more than that, especially with broilers being short-ish cycles. So you're looking at argument's sake 45 days. So I would not buy more feed than what I would need for that cycle. And then when, you, when you're when you planning your next cycle, buy the feed for the next cycle. I wouldn't go much longer than that. Um, but it does have a shelf life of six months. So from a retailer point of view, that's, that's, always, um, that's always nice to know. On the bulk side, same principle, depending on what your storage looks like. If you've got brand new bulk tanks, um, uh, you could probably keep it in there for about a month. But again, bulk tanks stand outside. Outside means it gets sun on it every day, all day, obviously if it's sunny, um, which increases the heat inside the tank, which then high increase in heat means you've got, you might have condensation or moisture buildup. Now, a lot of these bulk tanks come out with what they call a chimney or let off that uh, that actually lets the moisture out as it builds up, um, but but it is important to remember that that feed does get hot and cold and hot and cold, which could could cause mold buildup. Um, so just like chickens love our feed, and luckily a lot of other things also love our feed. So um, just make sure that your storage is good and and um, that it, uh, you don't keep it much longer than a month. Again, like I said, if you buy feed for a cycle of birds, that should do the trick. Um, I wouldn't buy for two or three cycles all at once. I would buy for one cycle at a time. Um, so well, I hope that uh, that answers your question. Um, um, then Zusipe's next question, can you substitute finisher in the step of grower when furniture is not supplied locally. I'm going to direct this one at Stefan. He's our national technical manager. Um, so as far as as uh, feeding and technical expertise, he's probably the best person to answer this question. Stefan. Yeah, thanks, Walter. Very interesting question here from Zuzipe, and I think also very appropriate. I think, you know, we all aim in a perfect world to have feed available everywhere um, in all phases and in all um, locations but unfortunately from time to time stockers can run out and um, it can happen that the specific product is not available. I think um, you know if we, if we talk about substitution um, in the grower and finisher phase it's it's not all that uncommon um, and certain people do it for certain reasons but to step back from nutritional point of view it, we need to understand what's the difference between a grower and a finisher and um, in episode five which is next week um, we'll spend a bit more time in detail on, on, on this this area but i think just quickly speaking in terms of a grower and a finisher the grower is normally your higher spec um, in terms of, of protein and a bit um, lower in energy where the finisher is again a bit higher in energy and a bit lower in protein so um, it's all aimed at feeding the right amount of nutrients at the right ratio at the right age of the bird. Um, like I say, it's it's not uncommon for it to happen for a, a guy to just grow, keep on with the grower right, right through and, and just a post finisher or a maintenance at the end of the cycle or even to go from a finisher, from a starter to a finisher and, and run through with that to the end of the cycle. Um, just two things to remember. I think the first one is in general, a finisher is, is, is a bit cheaper than a grower um, feed. Um, so you, you are paying a bit more for a grower ration and then um, the second point is obviously because these diets are aimed at a specific phase of the chicken's growth it will not be as cost effective in terms of optimal performance when you substitute as when you feed normally but the, 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 the differences can be relatively small but it also depends on you know until what age you grow um, how long did you feed the starter for 
and, and, and those considerations. So, yes, you, you can substitute, um, but there's, a, a, like I say, a bit of a financial impact and, and possibly a bit of a performance impact. All right, That's brilliant. Welcome. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Um, the next question is again from Randall. Um, I'm also going to answer this one, but after it, I'll, I'll, I'll set it open for, for one of the guys to maybe comment on it as well. And um, the question is, what is optimal feed consumption ratios for 7, 14, 21 and 28 days and weight standards? Um, now, I just need to stop here quickly. So there's a term that we often use called FCR and um, you'll often see it. Now, FCR stands for feed conversion ratio. Um, so I'm going to assume that the listener is talking about or that Randall is talking about the, the FCR that we always refer to now. Just to quickly explain what the FCR or the feed conversion ratio is. In simple terms, all it means is that is the amount of feed needed for the bird to pick up one kg of weight. So there's always that you need to, to have a look at that because that's where your, your efficiency comes from. And that is where, so the, the better your FCR, so the le less feed you need to put on one kg of weight, the, the more profitable you'll be um, just from an efficiency point of view. Um, so uh, what I did is I, I, I drew an article that, that uh, one of our, our research guys did, uh, Dean Backhouse, a while ago, um, just comparing the different feeds that we ourselves make. Um, on a scientific basis and I, what I need to mention is that these were done under experimental environments so they are they are as good as it can get I don't think you'll get much better than this um, and they're managed by by guys who are phenomenal at doing this so um, but I, I would like to mention them for you so when you're looking at an FCR you're looking at somewhere between so from day zero to day seven, so the first week, you're looking at around one, FCR of one. And um, from day zero to 14, so you'll see we take it from zero to 14, zero to 21, and zero to, because you, that's the total amount of feed that you fed. So zero to 14 is about 1.2. Um, zero to 21, you're looking at about 1.34. Zero to 28, at about 1.47, and then 1.53 for full term. Now, there's different feeds and different, so even in our own ranges between the sugar economy and OptiGrow, there are differences. So this is this is a, a brilliant example of what you put in is what you get out. Um, so make sure that you're not going for the cheapest possible feed because that's not always the best option from a profitability point of view. Um, Donnie and, and Sipo mentioned this in, in episode three last week. So if you are interested, please go have a look back at what they what they mentioned. They look at it in, in detail. Um, and then also the weight standards that you're referring to, Randall. Um, these are just according to the manuals. You're looking at seven days, about 170 grams. Now, again, that can differ from 160 all the way up to 200 if you're getting you're putting rocket fuel into them. I'm joking, jokingly saying rocket fuel, but a very high quality, very high des de um, dense ration. Um, so 170, 14 days, you're looking at about 450. 21 days, about 890. 28 days, about 1.45, and then at 35 days, about two kgs. But again, this is a this is a an average, and that can range massively. Um, big differences that you can see in that. Um, but those are those are good target weights. If you can get those, you're doing all right. You're doing all right. Um, then I'd just like to to pass this on, Sipo, I don't know if you'd like to add anything onto this based on your your um, economics or your profitability talk you had last week. Um, well, sir, thanks, thanks for, you know, passing the question over to me. Um, I think you've covered pretty much um, all, all that there is to mention, uh, maybe to highlight the fact that, um, you know, these weights and these consumptions <clears throat> need to be in line with the brief that's being used. Um, it might differ slightly or it might vary slightly depending on the on the breed. Um, I've, I've seen this quite a, a growing trend now of people using, call it more of indigenous chickens than, than your commercially bred uh, broiler chickens as well. So, you know, just farmers need to keep in mind that there will be that slight variation and the numbers are not going to be as accurate. Um, but if it's a commercial breed like Cobb, Ross um, and, and the other guys, uh, the figures that you've provided should more or less uh, still be in line. Awesome. Thank you, Sipo. 
Okay, our next question is from Kati. She has asked you, what is biosecurity? Um, Martin. Hey, Walter. Thank you very much. Kati, great question. So a biosecurity can be described as procedures or measures designed to protect the population against harmful biological or biochemical substances. So this can include, um, the protection can include fencing around your cages, limiting movement uh, between your cages and your farm. So um, your birds can catch illnesses, not just through um, myself walking from one uh, chicken cage to another or another farm visiting your farm, but also um, from, uh, I get a lot where when customers come to collect the chickens and then they're allowed to reverse very close to your cage and also um, walk in and select uh, the chickens that they'd like. So that is one thing that is a hazard to biosecurity because that gentleman or lady or customer rather may have purchased chickens elsewhere the day before and now they come to your farm. Um, you are unaware because these illnesses or sickness to the chickens are not visible to the eye. And then he can live, leave some of that litter that blows off from the back of that bucky into your cages and it affects your chickens. So you have to watch that. So one um, tip um, to control that is fencing and limiting movement um, close to your cages and then signage signage is very important you want to put on signage to say um, stop no entry here you want to put in another signage to say when you uh, when you enter the houses wash your wash your boots um, uh, let's say use um, a disinfector to disinfect yourself uh, disinfect your hands before you work with the chickens disinfect yourself and your hands when you leave that particular cage to go to um, to attend to let's say customers or attend to moving feed or stock in the farm so foot baths in addition to that are also very important the tip I can give, because I get that farmers sometimes keep that water for far too long, then the disinfectant um, um, in the water uh, becomes non-reactive. So it, it dies out and it's not effective anymore. So you want to use um, two foot baths uh, entering your houses. One, I'd say it's clean water. Let's say you walked on the soil and you want to get into the next cage. Step into the clean water and you have a hand uh, brush or you can use a hand broom. You scrub the bottom of your boot, scrub it clean and get all that excess um, 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 bedding and, 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 and uh, bird droppings off there. And then you step into the disinfectant, uh, uh, which normally you administer through water. You step into that and then you access your cage and you follow the same step when you walk out of your cages. So please make sure that in the ideal world, you must have a pair of boots for every cage, but we understand that not all emerging farmers have the capacity to have have multiple houses or rather have a boot at every cage. So just try and measure those things and keep keep them as critical as possible. And then um, your fumigation, when you wash your cages in preparation for the next cycle, when you fumigate your cage and let it stand to dry, that is part of biosecurity. And I get that sometimes in, in the winter time where, where there's less heat. So when there's less heat, the viruses and bio, uh, bio threats thrive. So there's some farmers that do now and again, every third or fourth day, spray the, the non-harmful um, fumi uh, fumigation um I'd say a product into the air, not directly onto the kitchen, uh, the chickens that will assist in just keeping them as clean and disinfectant and allowing them to perform for the rest of the cycle. So biosecurity is um, can be described as the measures you put in place to protect your chickens and allowing them to perform. Thank you, Walter. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. It was very, very insightful, very practical. And um, from there, you mentioned the, the fumigation and disinfection. Um, so we're going to jump straight into the next question from Mel. Um, Stefan, I'm going to direct this one to you. Which disinfectors and fumigators should I use? Good question, Mel. Um, I think I would like to start off to say, um, obviously, for the purpose of this um, episode, we, we can't really um, promote a specific brand, but I'll, I'll focus on active ingredients. So um, normally you'll do the, the disinfection and fumigation during the clean-out phase. 
I think first, most important thing is do the proper wet and dry cleaning before you do either fumigation or disinfection. When we get to the disinfectants, um, there's two two main options for in terms of um, active ingredients. The first one is the, the glutaraldehyde-based um, products. It's seen as a high-level disinfectant. In other words, it's active against viruses, bacteria, fungus, um, and spores. So you get a real broad spectrum um, effect from the glutaraldehyde-based um, products. Then the second um, type of disinfectant would be your your quads or your QACs. Um, and I'll have to read this because it's a real tongue twister. So it's the quaternary ammonium compounds. And in this case, it's it's more focused on bacteria and it's um, effective against both gram positive and gram negative um, bacteria. Um, I think it, it's also important to, 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 to keep in mind when you do disinfection, um, the water must be slightly um, alkaline or at worst neutral when you if you've got a, a low pH or acidic water you lose the efficiency of your of your um, disinfectants um, and also please follow your manufacturing instructions on the label so make sure that you get the, the mixing instruction and con concentrations um, correct um, then when it comes to the fumigation of the house um, it's normally done on a formaldehyde based um, fumigant and important to know that you know the, the, it is a dangerous um, compound for humans. So when you use it, please use it with care, um, and please make sure that when you do it and you want the proper efficiency or efficacy of the product, make sure that the house is sealed um, and that the product doesn't escape. Thanks, Walter. Thank you, Stefan. I'm, I'm curious, though, Martin. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to add on to this. I, I know Stefan has got quite a bit of. Um, experience when it comes to larger commercial farms. Martin, is there anything other that you, you've been seeing on um, on the, call it the emerging side of the market, the smaller scale farmers, is, or is it pretty much the same thing? It's pretty much the same thing. Um, the thing is, there's a, there's a lot of, there's strong brands that are available on your closest co-ops or distributors um, with simple administration, um, administrative instructions that you can use. I won't name, mention any names, but there's there's one or two particular brands that they use a lot because um, in, in, in the emerging space, it's more disinfecting. And then the fumigation is what one thing that when I practically get to the farm, um, once we make contact and assist them to prepare for the next placement, the fumigation part is what um, sometimes they don't get right because it gets rushed. So farmers, part of uh, the episode that we're going to do, episode six, we will be uh, talking about house preparation. So I do urge you guys to please watch that episode. It's going to be in two weeks' time, the Thursday, that we will in detail go into on what to do. So if you want to find out on what more products, if you want to be brand specific and I can give you advice, please do contact me uh, privately. Send me an email or just call me or pop me a WhatsApp and I can assist you in what things you can use. But um, yeah, Walter, there's just a lot of brands available in the market. And it's just, uh, we just have to make sure that um, they're administered correctly. And if the farmer is not sure, please do contact us and we can assist where we can. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. I'd just like to add as well this, this uh, question in the previous one is biosecurity is one of those things that you can rather almost go overboard than, than not do enough. Yes, um, yeah. You often get guys who want to come into your house and come see how it looks. Just remember if they are carrying anything that's going to affect your birds, the damage is going to be on you. So rather be stricter and not allow anyone into your houses that have not gone through the proper call it disinfection or whatever. And then, then letting anyone or everyone come in because you don't want to offend them. Rather be stricter than not. Yeah, and Walter, one, one way to manage this is you are not a supermarket as a farmer. It, then people can't just come in and uh, look at your products and go. It must happen. You must be more professional with your system by saying, if you're interested in purchasing, call me. Let's set up an appointment so that you can also, as the far as the farmer, um, prepare your your biosecurity. Um, let's say you change your 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 water and your foot baths in time and fixing your disinfectant, so that when the client comes to the farm, 
you are prepared for them. So let's also start managing our, our route to market, managing our customers coming to our farms. This will greatly assist us in being, being able to, to manage our biosecurity effectively and also not have wastage. Because now if we, if we have to just allow people walking in and out of the farm, you'll end up going through a lot of more um, uh, uh, disinfectants and fumigators and so on. So you want to have it controlled, and um, especially now in winter. You want to have it controlled and only visits by appointment. Be very strict about that. Awesome. No, I agree 100%. Thank you, Martin. Um, our next question is from Tambile. Um, how more, much should a noise distance be for proper broiler rearing when you live next to a gravel road? Martin, would you start uh, start on a answer there for us, please? Yes, yes, Walter. Um, I'd say I've been I've been reading a bit about it. Um, so they I haven't got a, a scientific um, distance allocation to the to the distance. But one thing I'd like to add is, or a couple of things I'd like to add is, um, you have to consider how far you are to the road. Let's say if a car had to accidentally bump your bump your wall and the wall falls. So how far that wall will be from your cages? So I'd say. Um, a good three meters, if you have space and it allows. If I'm talking now, Walter, from the uh, farmers with the most minimal space, about mm -hmm. 3.5 to 5 meters away from the road, because almost um, um, most of our emerging farmers don't have the allowance to have the, 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 the fence of the property and the cages far away from, from the road. So sometimes it's right on the road. So we just want to give it some distance from, let's say, your fence to your houses about 3.5 to 5 meters um, um, away from it. And what you need to consider is that the hooting, um, so it's always good, part of your biosecurity to put up a sign to say no hooting. So chickens are better reactive to constant noise. So I'll use my hands. If, if you hear, if the chickens hear this, right, they quickly adapt to that and then they, they, they don't get disturbed or they don't get stressed. But if it's a loud noise, like a, a truck that's rushing past and it's, it has maybe bricks at the back and it's making a loud noise, the chickens get stressed. And in cases like that, you have to add um, um, administer things like stress pack, right? But also consider the wind, where the wind flows from towards a cage and consider the dust that comes from the, um, 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 the, the, the road next to you. So also um, remember when we spoke about, um, uh, I think it was episode two, when Sipo and them um, was talking about housing, the positioning of your house, and also considering where the wind blows from. Walter, would you like to add to that? Martin, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to throw this one at, uh, at Sipo. Um, he's got quite a bit of experience in KZN. We've got the, the advantage of having a lot more space than, than uh, a lot of the guys do in Gauteng. Um, so I'm going to ask Sipo because he's had quite a bit of experience on, on our, on our ex, um, emerging market here, which they often have a lot of space to work with. So Sipo, your opinion? Yes. Awesome. Um, thanks, Walter and Martin. Um, I think Martin has pretty much covered it. Um, the second message there is you want to create a, as quiet an environment for your chickens as possible um, so that you can minimize the stress that comes with movement, noise, sound, and, and all of that. So you want to create as minimal um, you know, noise as possible. Um, Martin touched uh, briefly also on the issue of dust. Um, Dust does pose a risk, um, again, from a respiratory point of view. Um, you know, if, if those chickens inhale the dust, you might actually end up with sick chickens as well. Um, you know, dust particles also carrying bacteria and viruses uh, that can actually land up in the chicken houses. So the, I think the second message is as quiet as possible and the further you are from any road for that matter, the better. Awesome. Thank you, Sipo. Um, I'd just like to add on that, and Sipo did allude to it. Remember, the less stress you can place on your birds, the better they will perform. The better the FCR, the less mortalities, the higher your profitability. So that's 100%. Your main aim should be to stress those birds as little as possible. Martin also mentioned the, the stress pack, which is it's basically um, um, electrolytes, my, vitamins, minerals, micro minerals. Um, but those help birds to also cope with the stress slightly better. So um, the less stress, the better, 100%.
Um, our next question, um, I'm going to direct this one at you, Stefan. It's from Loazi. Um, what causes the chicks to make a snoring sound and how can that be treated? Yes, Loazi, um, interesting question. Um, I think important to, to, to at this stage just mention um, that when it comes to, 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 to poultry diseases, it's important to, to describe as many symptoms as possible and also uh, to discuss it with the, with the right expertise. So I'm probably going to battle to give you a specific answer. We've got an, an upcoming episode, it would be I think around about episode 9 or 10, we, we've got our, our um, poultry speciality um, veterinarian um, that will be part of the series. If you want, I think it would be nice if, if you can um, just add to your question and, and add a bit of detail in terms of, of, of other symptoms or the age of the birds. But I think I'll, I'll try and, and, and just give you a, a broad overview of, of, of what it can be. So by the sound of it, it, it must be some sort of a upper respiratory tract um, disease. Um, one that comes to mind is a, is a, is a fungal-based disease or that originates from, from um, um, inhaling spores. Um, and that's uh, aspergillosis or asp that you might have worked of the term before. So um, that specific disease, because it's a fungal disease, it's, it's not really that well treatable, especially in broilers with a, with a short lifespan. Um, prevention is better, so ensuring no mold growth through the whole chain, you know, whether it's at the, at the breeder houses where the, the broiler eggs come from, um, where the broilers are hatched from, or, you know, hatchery conditions or, um, or your own farm conditions. So, so please, you know, prevent any mold growth um, in that whole, whole chain. Um, some other options is um, um, infectious bronchitis, also a, 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 a respiratory tract in, um, disease. This one is a virus, so not really treatable. Um, in conventional means, again, more, more prevention in terms of vaccination, um, advisable, yeah. Then you've got your chronic respiratory disease, that's a bacterial disease, and it normally originates in, you know, when there's a stress um, situation, and that's from the mycoplasma um, family, the, the galiseptikum one, where, you, where that disease originates from. And then the, the last one that I would like to mention is infectious coryza. Um, also, you know, playing a role in the in the, the nasal tract of the of the, the bird and the sinuses. So if you see the, the, the normal, you know, almost the flu-like signs in the in the, in the nasal tracts, then it can be an infectious coryza. But I think, you know, in terms of properly answering your question and um, and again talking about treatment specifically, you need to be very sure about what disease you're treating, um, because it can be a very costly exercise, and you would need to ensure that you you get the right um, efficacy of the medication that you're using. Thanks, Walter. Awesome. Thank you, Stefan. I'd just like to add here as well, and something that Stefan did mention is with many of these things, prevention is better than cure. So, so if you manage your 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 houses effectively as well. You won't have that moisture build up. You won't have carbon dioxide build up. All of that. Now it is getting cold, and I see they've predicted a nice cold spell for pretty much the whole of South Africa coming up this uh, weekend and then early next week. Um, there is that. You, you might be tempted to actually not have that ventilation and rather up the heat in the houses to keep the birds warm. But remember, heat means nothing without efficient ventilation and oxygen. Um, also, just make sure that you're, if you're using coal-fired or wood-fired um, burners that, that are inside the house, and Martin mentioned it earlier, that those are that, that the, the smoke and the, the residue is, is pulled outside and that there's nothing inside the house. But we did mention it in, in early episodes is if you walk in and it smells funny or it feels stuffy or any of those things, then it's probably stuffy for the chicks as well. So just make sure that that, that ventilation and the, the litter management and all of that is also done done um, correctly and efficiently. And if you are unsure, please contact one of our TAs or one of our sales managers at the mills, and they will be more than happy to help you. Right, then our next question is from Paul. Um, this is a, a slightly more difficult question. I'm going to pass it on to Sipo because he uh, he dealt with with uh, with profits 
um, last week, um, the episode last week with Donnie. Um, the question reads, estimate, prof estimate profits for certain amounts of chickens to farm with. How many chickens equals how much profit? Sipo, your ideas on that. Um, thanks, Walter. Um, and again, I, I would like to to open, you know, this question to my other colleagues as well, if they might have, um, you know, a different take to it. Um, but to to cut to the chase, uh, Mpo, I would not have a definite answer to that. Um, and and I'm saying this with with almost, uh, you know, utmost respect, um, given the fact that no business is the same as the next business, um, and the cost that you're going to get into um, to produce them is going to be different for farm two and you know and the rest of the farms even in the same neighborhood even if it were three or four different farms you know all lined up in the same neighborhood so your cost configurations for your business um, is what will determine more or less at what cost do you do you produce at um, once you've established the cost, then you have the issue of gross profit uh, versus net profit. Um, so you have you have the issue of saying gross profit would be the revenue generated minus the cost of producing those chickens, and that's definitely not going to be the same. Um, that would be influenced by um, you know things like what sort of products did you use, and is it a premium product? Is it an entry level product? You know um, what sort of additional labor is required to actually produce that chicken to to whatever waste that you're targeting. Um, and to whatever um, production cycle that you're looking at. So um, all these factors compounded would, would um, yield to a different cost perspective uh, from one business to another. Um, and then, so then we, we pack the cost, um, you know, point uh, on one side, and then we look at the selling price in the market. Um, different markets are willing to, um, you know, to accept different prices. So if you as a business person decide um, as an example, it cost me 42 rands to produce my chicken, but I'm going to sell it at, um, call it 50 rands. Then you're making a gross profit of 8 rands per unit produced from your business. But your neighbor or, or somebody else or farm two could be selling, say, at um, 60 rands, in which case um, he's making 12 rands, uh, you know, per unit. And obviously that's in multiples. So if you have 100 chickens, you're making uh, 12 rands uh, per chicken must fly by 100. Um, that should probably work up, in, you know, something in the region of 12,000 rands or whatever the amount is. So um, it, it would be difficult to pin it into saying if you have 100 chickens, you're going to make 100,000 rands. I'm using that again as a bizarre example. Um, but my advice would then be, you know, um, keep records, um, keep records of, you know, what cost and, you know, what payments have you had to make in order to produce that particular batch of chickens. Look at what the market, um, you know, demand is and what the market selling price is, and then as a business, you would then position yourself um, based on the cost and based on what the market is willing to to accept as a selling price. You will then be able to determine um, what uh, your profit is for the business, be it gross, uh, in which case we said it's revenue minus cost of production, or net, uh, which is um, revenue minus cost of production plus uh, fixed cost uh, for your business. So um, again, not a straight answer, but um, it does sort of give an idea of how to go about to understanding whether are you making profit and uh, for what you need, will you, you know, will, uh, will you be making what um, sort of amounts in terms of profit? Um, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd, I'd rather maybe leave the, you know, the question open and maybe invite uh, my other colleagues to tap into that space if need be. Uh, Sipo, you are quite spot on with your answer. The thing is you can prepare to place a thousand chickens but halfway through, you might get a sickness within your cages and you have to pay for administration of antibiotics and so on, which also affects the, the consumption of water and feed, which slows down the growth of the chicken, which means to feeding a bit longer. So it's quite a difficult question. I would rather if Mpo uh, has a, already has a farm set up um, and they are already farming, I'd rather him maybe just contact us, um, then we can maybe deal with it with a scenario. If he says, I have so many chickens, this is what I feed, this is all my mortalities and whatnot, and we can assist in going through those calculations with him. But yeah, every, every like, like Sipo said, farms would differ because all these other factors you have to put into play um, 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 to answer that question. Also, awesome. just to add there, Martin, as well, maybe, um, sorry, to start with, um, I think it would be good to maybe get a preliminary 
management card from EPOL. Um, it does have all um, you know aspects of what records should be kept. Um, it does also have a section where you can sort of um, compile your cost. Um, then based on that, you would be able to more or less um, be able to see how much you're spending on producing and. You know, you can look at what the market is, you know, is accepting as a price and you can determine um, your profitability for that specific, um, you know, farming business. Awesome. Thank you, James. That was very insightful. Um, yes, I just just like to summarize on that, um, like, like Martin also mentioned, if you are in a specific area, please get in contact with one of our TAs so that they can, they can take your specific scenario, your specific situation and, and work on a budget. And like Martin also mentioned, even if you work on a budget and you work out what your profit is going to be, it's it's never 100% that that's how it's going to be. Unluckily, life happens and things go wrong and we have to adapt. And the more resilient we are, the better we'll survive. But um, it's definitely, please contact the TAs and they'll also be able to provide you with a management card. They'll help you to fill it out. Um, because things to consider is how far are you from your feed manufacturer, where are you getting your checks from, all of those things differ between the, the different areas and where you're based. So uh, please, again, feel free to contact us and we'll, we'll work on something for your specific situation and have a look at what you could be making on, on, uh, on checks. Then the next one, if I'm going to direct this one again to you, um, is from Mashaya. Um, when looking into quality management in the poultry business, what are the basic principles, guidelines, or framework one could refer to? And how is the industry regulated to ensure that all stakeholders adhere to the requirements? Now, that's quite a mouthful and quite a loaded question. Um, people, so I'll give you a moment to answer, and then I'll, I'll open it up to Martin and, and, and Stefan as well to see if they've, they've got any, any thoughts on um, on that answer. Yes. Um, thanks, Walter. Maybe maybe let's break that question into two into two um, you know separate questions. Um, the one section would be when looking at quality management in the in the broiler business uh, or in the poultry business. What are the basic principles and guidelines that one should refer to? Um, I think I can you know almost summarize it into two things. Uh, the one part is animal welfare. Um, you know, those animals need to be protected from harm. They need to have food. They need to be, um, you know, to be housed and they need to be compatible, you know, freedom to, to, to exercise and, um, you know, um, show normal natural behavior and all of that. So the one aspect of good or good management or quality management would fairly and squarely lie on animal welfare matters. So those animals should not be abused in, in, in any way um, that's not necessary. The one part is, um, you know, good management practices. You know, from a business point of view, um, you want to supply all that is required for, for your chickens to, to compatibly grow and perform. Um, and that is usually uh, recommended or backed up by uh, a couple of industry regulators. Uh, from a poultry point of view, you are looking at uh, Southern African Poultry Association that sort of actively engages different producers um, in the market. You've also got uh, developing um, far, uh, developing poultry farmer um, organization as well, which is linked to SAPA. Um, they also have quite a lot of interest in that. So they develop those guidelines in terms of saying, what are the good management practices that would make sure that you don't more or less endanger your animals in the process of growing them uh, for meat consumption? So that would be one aspect. But the second part of the question would then be, um, what are regulations or what regulations are there in the industry to make sure that all stakeholders adhere to these requirements? Um, and, and that also depends on um, which or who, in, you know, is the stakeholder in this particular instance. For instance, if you look at EPOL as a feed producer, um, we, we are first accountable to our consumers. We are also accountable to government, but at the same time, there's also um, AFMA, Animal Feed Manufacturers Association, that also closely monitor, you know, what's happening in the industry. And um, they also try and, and as far as possible, um, you know, sort of uh, become activists in, 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 in the compliance with, uh, you know, industry regulations such as Act uh, 36 of 1947. But largely, we are regulated by government um, and, and we do subscribe to, to good management practices. And from our part as a feed company as well, we make sure that we deliver a product that is safe 
for animal consumption and also safe, uh, you know, final products uh, for as food for human consumption as well. So there, there's a host of other, um, you know, um, call it industry regulators um, and, and organizations that are activists in that space, make sure that, you know, all that operates in that space actually adhere to, to good management practices and do not uh, interfere with animal welfare. I mean, if you look at it from a, from a technical advising point of view or from a scientist point of view, um, there is a council, South African Natural and Scientific uh, Professions Council, uh, SACNASP in short, that also makes sure that the quality of the advice that we give to our consumers, um, you know, is actually spot on and that actually delivers the results or solves the problems that it's intended to, to solve. Um, if you look at, at it from a, a producer point of view, um, the government is there, the one of the culture is there. Um, there is, like I said, X36 of 1947 that regulates what's happening in the feed space, but also, um, you know, um, to try and make sure that we, we are all in level in terms of what is expected of us as um, stakeholders in the industry. So there's, again, a host of other stakeholders and there's a host of other, you know, interest group, you know, that practice in that space to make sure that everyone that plays in that space, you know, plays by the rules, um, you know, for, for safe production of feed uh, and safe production of food for human consumption. I'm not sure. Uh, Steph, Martin, uh, do you have something to maybe add on that? Hi, Sipo. I strongly believe that you've touched on all the points to consider. And, uh, I won't be doing just as if I had more to add. Appreciate it. Steph? I agree there, Martin. I think that Sipo did a very good job there at um, giving comprehensive feedback. I think the, the one benefit of, of, of the poultry industry, it's, it's highly competitive. Um, so, you know, for people to cut corners, they'll be very quickly um, taken out of the system in terms of competitors. So you can't put a poor quality feed in the system because people just stop buying it. If your chicks aren't up to standard, um, the word will quickly go around. So it's an open market and, 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 and a well-controlled industry with, with regards to that. 100%. Thank you, Jens. That was, uh, that was very well answered, Sipa. I'm very impressed. Um, the next uh, three questions relate to, to vaccinations. Um, now, Stefan alluded to this earlier, that uh, in a later episode, so I think it would be probably around episode 10 or 11, but just uh, keep an eye out on our, our social media platforms um, for the adverts that come out. You'll see when it is. Um, but our in-house vet will be, will be online, and uh, they will look at specifically at vaccinations and diseases and things to look out for. Um, we'll touch on some of these, and I'm going to ask Stefan to do that. Um, I think he's the most uh, most uh, eloquent to do that. Um, but but y'all just remember that the in-house vet will be online to to look at everything um, that's disease or vaccination related. Um, Stefan, but the first of the three questions is from Safiso. Um, now this is more from a hatchery point of view. Um, should I trust my hatchery that they have vaccinated the chicks or should I still do my own vaccination irregardless? What vaccine do I use at what point and how do I administer? So, Fisher, thanks for that question. Um, I think what I'll do since there's three questions around with vaccination, I'm going to answer the first part of your question and then the second part I'll answer together with, with question number two. Um, so the question about trusting your, your hatchery, um, I think the, the, the big point um, to consider is, you know, who, who is the hatchery that you're buying from? You know, where do they operate from? Have they been around for a long time? Um, are they a reputable supplier? If you buy directly from them, obviously it's it's very easy to, to determine whether they are vaccinating or not. Um, if you buy indirectly, it's, it's maybe a bit more difficult. But I think, like I said in, in my presentation in episode one, 99.9% .9 of, of hatcheries in the country will vaccinate for, for Newcastle disease. So you, you can rest assured that you'll be covered for Newcastle disease for at least the, the, the first um, 10 days of the of the chick's life. Um, I think some of the hatcheries will also administer a, a, a IB or infectious bronchitis um, vaccination. Um, but again, that depends from um, region to region. Um, but I think suffice to, suffice to say that um, you can you can rest assured that the Newcastle Newcastle and vaccination would have been administered um, at the hatchery. 
think we can move to the next question, Walter, and then I'll answer it together with, with the second part of the, the question. All right, splendid. Um, the next question is from Paul. Um, what type of vaccines are available and which ones are recommended? Okay, Paul, I think, um, uh, thanks again for your question as well. Um, in terms of, of, of vaccines, um, like I said, normally a, a, a Newcastle vaccine will be administered in the Sorry, I think it seems we've uh, we've hit a bit of a technical glitch there. Um, we've lost Stefan. Um, so just from like I mentioned, um, the next two are, are on vaccines. So Paul has asked about the types of vaccines and recommendations, and then Mishaya has asked about what are the problems related to administration of too much vaccine to the chicks. I think what we'll do is let's let this one stand over to to episode ten. I think it's 10 or 11, and um, when they announce vectors and they can answer the, the question uh, with all of the expertise that comes around it, because vaccinations and, um, and diseases are vet, vet specific. Um, we're animal nutritionists, so we try and help as much as we can, and you get to know certain things in the industry, but I think it, it needs to be left to the vets to, to elaborate on these. Um, so, if it's all right with you, gents, I don't know, Martin, Sipo, if you'd like to add anything to that, you're welcome. Oh, Walter, no, from my side. Um, nothing. Yeah, from my side, Walter, you've, you've you can go it uh, correctly um, because as a nutritionist, we focus on the link between the broiler performance and feed. And we always would like to make sure that you get expert advice for the, from the responsible person. That's why the, we have included our in-house vet to assist with these questions. And uh, it's the same as in field, um, um, Walter. You get cases where you get questions and you ask uh, the farmer just to give you a second so you can refer back to our internal um, resources um, just to make sure that we give the best advice um, um, for, for their performance. Um, but yeah, you're correct. Uh, we'll leave it to our in-house vet. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Sipo. Thank you to Stefan in, in his uh, absence. We've unluckily lost him. Um, but he'll be back next week again um, with myself. Um, and we'll be looking at the introduction at broiler nutrition and uh, what to feed when, how, and why um so yeah thank you all of you for joining us um, we apologize that we didn't get to any more of your questions um, but please keep them coming we'll answer them as as well as we possibly can and on the social media as well um, but we'll handle deal with some of them at uh, at the end of next week's episode as well thank you very much have a lovely week and weekend i hope you're not too cold um, but luckily cold comes with very beautiful snow so enjoy that, um, and thank you to the, the others of my colleagues who hosted with me. Goodbye.